Good morning, second service. You guys good? Yeah, all right. You're full in here. Let me remind you that uh, first and third service has a little more space, and uh, we always have an overflow in the chapel as it starts to get a little cozy in here. Uh, if you want to grab your Bible, your device, you can join me in Revelation chapter 2, and uh, that's where we're going to be this morning. A- about 60 years after Jesus had risen from the grave and de- or ascended into heaven, uh, John, the last eyewitness apostle uh, living, uh, he, he was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he was visited by an angel and given a revelation, an unveiling of the glory of the risen Jesus Christ. The curtain was pulled back, so to speak, and John gets a glimpse of what's really going on in the world. It's the story of the kingdom of God that Jesus declared in his sermons, and, and he described in his parables again and again. And through a vision, uh, John sees and he hears the kingdom coming in full and how it's all going to go down from God's perspective. Uh, but God didn't just reveal this for John's sake. You see, John wasn't the only Christian who was suffering in a broken world and uh, for his loyalty to Jesus Christ. And he wasn't the only follower of Jesus enduring the temptation to just give up hope in Jesus and just give in and give in to the lies of the devil and, and give in to the world's way of seeing and doing life. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, a couple weeks ago, or last week we looked at this, John receives this command from Jesus. Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. And so, in other words, the book of Revelation is one letter intended to be circulated among seven churches in Asia Minor, okay, modern-day Turkey. Uh, but these were not the only churches in the Roman province of Asia at that time. It was expected, it was anticipated that they would pass on and share this letter, the letter of Revelation, to the other churches. Some interpreters have assigned these seven churches to represent seven successive ages in church history, but I would contend there's no biblical warrant to do that. The number seven in Jewish apocalyptic literature, which is what this is, symbolizes completeness. And so, in a sense, these seven churches represent all churches. Uh, at their time, and in fact, they do represent the fullness of the church for all time. We've said it like this in the last two weeks. The revelation of Jesus Christ was written to them, the original churches in the first century, but it was written for us and for every church family throughout history. You'll notice these words in the text today in chapter 2, verse 7. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The beginning of this letter There are specific prophetic messages directed to each of the seven churches, and yet the Holy Spirit is saying something in all of it to the churches. In other words, what God intended is that this church, uh, the church throughout Asia Minor and throughout history would read each other's mail. Are you with me? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, so as we look at these seven messages and over the next seven Sundays, The word to our church family is, hey, examine yourself. And if the shoe fits, wear it. Each of these messages in this letter has something to say to us. Truth for us to apply. We will be convicted, encouraged, warned, and blessed as we read them. The overarching call or the invitation for each of the seven churches then and for us today is that we would be men and women who conquer, who overcome the lies of the devil the pull of our sinful nature and the broken philosophies in this world. Okay? To overcome by holding on to the truth, by holding on to faith in who Jesus Christ is, he's the one who has overcome. In a world where we see people uh, who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ compromise with the values of the world and turn away from holiness and give up on faith and lose heart, to overcome is to hang on to the truth of God's word in a way that you get to know and believe and treasure Jesus Christ. Okay? But also in a way that you get to see yourself and see the world in light of him. To overcome is to hang on to Jesus, to be in his family, and to be on mission as a witness to his glory with your life. To overcome ultimately is to share in the eternal life and the joy of the kingdom of God with the king. What you should notice over these seven weeks is that according to God's point of view, not all church families are equally healthy. Jesus is like, I know what's going on in the church. And sometimes there's praise and sometimes not so much. And so what you see and hear in these messages 
through the triumphs and the failures and the struggles of these local church families are a commentary on the sort of things that the church has been dealing with throughout history and maybe even here in our church family today. Question, has the church always gotten it right? Uh, No. Are there legitimate reasons that sometimes people who have been brought up in the church feel like they have to deconstruct aspects of their faith? Sadly, and unfortunately, the answer to that is yes. But here's what you should also notice as we move through this next seven weeks. The reality of the gospel changed lives and flipped the Roman Empire upside down so much so that it made it all the way to you and I sitting here today. What you should notice is that the words of this book, by the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, actually encouraged and empowered genuine followers of Jesus Christ in these churches to persevere, to overcome, to be faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ to a lost and broken world. And so I say to you this morning, as we dig in to the first of these seven messages to the churches, now it's our time. Now it's our time. This is the same story we're living in today, and if we're going to be a part of what God's up to in this world, what's he up to? He's overcoming the kingdom of darkness. He's restoring the kingdom on this earth, his kingdom. And it's our turn to have ears to hear. And it's our turn to accept and to hold on to the truth. And it's our turn to endure hardship. It's our turn to repent and to witness to the glory of Jesus Christ to a lost and broken world. Okay, Let's begin this morning in chapter 2, verse 1. The letters to the seven churches. The letter to Ephesus, chapter 2, verse 1. Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. The word angel in the Greek is literally a messenger from God. So this could be an angelic being. It could refer to the shepherd or the pastor of the church. It could be a messenger who carried the letter and read it to the church. I don't think we need to have a strong opinion on that. What do we know about Ephesus, the church here in Ephesus? Well, a few things might help us to understand the context. The gospel was uh, brought here most likely after Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, you can remember that, right? The Jewish pilgrims who were in Jerusalem made their way back home here. And the Apostle Paul showed up actually in Acts chapter 19. And he set up shop here in Ephesus for two years, teaching and sharing the good news of of Jesus Christ. Ephesus was a, a capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was a hub of powerful people, influential people, politically, culturally, socially, or spiritually. It was filled with religious people who worshipped an array of gods and magicians and and sorcerers and exorcists. The Roman emperor, Domitian, uh, had named Ephesus uh, the guardian of the imperial cult. That was, you know, people who worshipped the emperor as lord and god. The temple of Artemis. Uh, at Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There was a large contingent of Jews at Ephesus, which is why in Acts chapter 19, Paul started sharing the gospel in the Jewish synagogue there. And then eventually, he ended up teaching for two years up on the hill in the marketplace, the Agora. Uh, He lectured as a Roman citizen could in the hall of Tyrannus. Acts chapter 19 records this. Luke in, in verse 10 writes that, All the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. No wonder why John starts here with this church. After escaping a town riot at the amphitheater in in Acts chapter 20, Luke shares how Paul uh, left the churches uh, that he planted throughout the region that had penetrated both the Jewish and the Gentile worlds. He left them in the hands of the Ephesian elders. And... um, the church elders. Ephesus becomes a major hub of Christianity. And now, at the time John writes this, he receives his revelation, it had been four decades since Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesian church, the one in the New Testament, from his imprisonment in Rome. So there's a little bit on on what's going on at the church. Revelation 2, verse 1. Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who, hold, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. If you remember from last week, this is Jesus Christ in all of his glory. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. 
I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. So first of all, notice that Jesus is present. I know. I know, he says. Like he sees it all. I know what's going on in the church family. And they're commended. Like imagine if John Nito were to gather all of us on a Sunday and say, hey, I got a letter from Jesus. We know it's from him because it's written in red ink. And then John reads it aloud. It's a church joke, right? John reads it aloud. Like this is what would have happened as these churches gathered in Ephesus. Can you imagine hearing this? Uh, like he knows what we're doing. And he knows that we're, we're holding on to the apostles' teaching. And we're devoted and we're excelling in our effort and doing good works. And we're holding tight to the truths of Scripture. We're not lazy. We're not indifferent to the truth. We're busy and we're persistent and we're, we're persevering through opposition. We don't tolerate sin or evil or false teachers. We recognize the damage that those things do to the relationships in the church and the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. By the way, for those of you um, who are brothers and sisters in the church, and especially for those of you who have been called to lead in the church, we have been called to love the sheep. Okay, you know, followers of Jesus, he calls us sheep a lot. You know, it's kind of a shepherd sheep thing, right? He's the shepherd. But, but listen, we've also been called to protect the wolves who come in to lead astray and to devour the sheep. Okay? Some people are just deceptive. And they're in it for the money or the gain or their pleasure. And so they're in the church, but they're actually wolves working for the enemy. All right? And here's the deal. You don't just love them by tolerating them and accommodating them. You love the sheep by establishing boundaries to protect the sheep, including yourself, from the wolves. Okay? So the church in Ephesus, like they had discernment about that. And they had a backbone to stand against error. And they were intolerant of poisonous lies and the liars who preyed on God's people. Okay? I'm sure they had a great uh, church discipline and systems and rules and policies. They were excellent at doctrinal precision. If that was the end of the message, that would be fantastic, but it's not. Jesus had some hard truth to share as well. Look, at verse, look with me at verse 4. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. You've laid it aside. You've sent it away. You've, you've given up on it. You've disregarded it. You've walked away from it. So, hey, you're dutiful and you're faithful, but I know your heart. And you're just going through the motions. You're involved in routine. Like you may be orthodox, but you're as cold as a refrigerator. You're just kind of done being kind and gracious and patient and understanding. The love that maybe once pounded in your hearts no longer pounds. The, the love is gone and only the routine remains. And you've become heavy-handed and authoritarian and judgmental and uncaring for people. Where's the affection for Jesus Christ? Where's the affection for others that flows from the love of Jesus Christ. You're doctrinally precise, but you've lost the capacity to love and care for imperfect people. But we're Bible-believing. Okay, but are you kind and gracious? Well, we speak the truth. Yeah, but do you speak it in love? We have convictions informed by the written Word of God. Yeah, but do you have compassion informed by the living Word of God? Abandoning your first love or losing your first love, some commentators have said that John is talking about the passion of when you first loved and knew Jesus. But here's why that's not likely the case. When you lose your love for Jesus, in Scripture it's contrasted with idolatry, like loving other things more than Him. But according to the commendations here, that's not this church's problem. Okay? It's not that they're falling into temptation or adultery with the world or you know, they're self-reliant or, or they're not tolerating or they're just tolerating the love of other things over Jesus. It's therefore more likely that the love that they've lost is a love for other people, which of course flows out of the gospel. Okay? And ultimately that is a love for God that's expressed in real life ways, right? Most biblical scholars explain that he's not necessarily talking about losing a love for Jesus. It's about a love for people that flows from the gospel. And so losing your love is about becoming turned inward on yourself in self-protection and in suspicion of others and judgment of others. And the question we should be asking ourselves here this morning is how do we have the tendency to become like the Ephesians? Okay? If we listen to the Bible, or if we just read it historically, like it's a bunch of interesting facts to understand, which what many people do, 
or if, or if we just read it theologically and use it to criticize these people, well, we're missing the entire point, okay? God gave this book to us that we might read it humbly and that if we come under it, and it, we might just say, you know what, I, I may be a lot like these guys. Or, or I, could, I could very easily become a lot like them, actually. And so this word is to them, but it's for us, okay? And so here's a few ways I think that it's possible this morning that we become like them. Think about your attitude toward other people, right? And, and how you allow them to become a frustration or an, an annoyance to you. And yet, would you consider that are not, are these not the people that God has called you to love? In the church, like, yeah, it's usually the more immature Christians, right? It's your brothers and sisters you struggle to get along with. I wish they wouldn't be so immature, right? Like, or, and what about the people outside the walls, okay? The, aren't they the people that God has called you to reach? Like, so listen, if, if you're constantly bitter or complaining about the immature people in here or the messed up, rebellious, dirty people who don't believe how you do about God's word out there, how are you loving them? Like, how are you willing to sacrifice or risk anything to love them? How are you expressing compassion for them? Think about your expectations on Christians who have the Holy Spirit and who are being transformed in their behavior versus your expectations on the lost and how they behave. Now, what do you expect from unbelievers? What do you expect? And but by the grace of God, you'd be just as messed up. Now, you don't have to like the things that they're doing or, or, or to like them, but you've been called to love them. And you've been given the Holy Spirit if you're in Christ, Romans 5.5. 5, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, Hey guys, God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Again, that doesn't mean be naive and, and just let wolves in here to hurt, our, hurt us or our families or our churches. There's always discernment and wisdom that we need from above, and the Holy Spirit will provide that. Okay. What else? How, how else do we become people who, might we become people who lose our love? Well, what about this one? All truth and no love, right? All truth, no love. Like crushing people with the law and making them feel ashamed and judgment, and condemnation when they blow it and when they fail, like without compassion, or without kindness. Sometimes that looks like valuing being right over relationships with a person who has a soul and who's been made in the image of God, right? Jesus was, John 1, John wrote that he was full of grace and full of truth, right? And then Paul wrote to the church in Rome that in Romans 2, 4, that his kindness leads to repentance is kindness speak the truth yeah yeah speak the truth but Ephesians 4 speak the truth to one another in love in love again it takes spiritual insight to know when to be tough and vigilant and and when to be tender and tolerant like full of grace and full of truth like that's our calling and it's not easy to determine on our own all the time and so that's why we need to be reliant on the Holy Spirit Right? And the Word of God. Here's one more. You ready? It, out of a fear of losing control, or sometimes it's a desire to be right, those who have determined to follow Jesus Christ may tend to draw lines too hard and boundaries too tightly on secondary and tertiary doctrinal issues. Not all doctrines are at the heart of the gospel. Okay? Not all errors are properly labeled heresy. Right? I might get something wrong. I'm, in, I'm fallible. That doesn't mean you get to run out of here and tell your friends that I'm a false teacher. Not all disagreements are worth fighting over. None are worth hating people over. Amen. You can read and you can understand Scripture and you can have all your questions answered and you can have all your little categories filled out and your systems in place. Okay? But you still need the Holy Spirit to illuminate the truth of Scripture to you and to use it to guide you and to direct you and to shape you and to fill you with the wisdom and the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? If you end up only listening to your doctrines 
and you ignore that you're supposed to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit that is glorifying Jesus Christ and that reflects Jesus Christ to others, well, what happens is you become dogmatic about things that you shouldn't be, and you end up being marked by a lack of love. <laughs> Bad plan. Okay? I think Paul said it the best when he said this to the church in Corinth. Gosh, this guy wrote to a lot of churches. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, he said that you can have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, teach, preach, prophecy, tongues, you name it. But without love for your brothers and sisters, you got nothing. How much is nothing? Zero. Zilch. Nada. Right? So Jesus says this to the church in Ephesus, you got a lot of good things going on, guys. Verse 4, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first, which means you got nothing right now. So what do we do? What do we do? Great question. Look with me at verse 5. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus says, remember. Remember who you are. Remember that you've been rescued by my grace and you've been set apart as holy, chosen, and dearly loved, as witnesses to my glory. And first of all, you need to see that you are falling short of the glory of God. You need to remember. But don't stop there, he says. You need to repent. In other words, feel the weight of your sin and run back to me in dependence. And then what else? He says, do the works that you did at first. What works? Well, a few years earlier, John wrote to this same church. We read it in his letter, 1 John 3, verse 16. We should lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let's not love in word or speech, but let's do it in action and in truth. And, and you know what John's talking about? He's talking about living out a kind of faith in Jesus where you express your love for other people in tangible, real, actual ways. Like serve them. <coughs> like sacrifice for them. Like lay down your life and your rights and your privileges for the sake of someone else. Okay, well, that's, that's hard, right? How, how do we do that? How do we love in action and in truth? How do we do the works that you did at first? Like, that, that's not something that we do for God. You ready? Pay attention. This is important. There's, it's something that God does for us in Jesus Christ. In us, through Jesus Christ. Do you realize this is what makes Christianity different than every other religion on the planet? Okay? The key is the gospel. You see... Before the command that John gave in 1 John to love, it starts with this. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. And before the command here in Revelation chapter 2, before he says, hey, you've lost your love, he says, it starts with Revelation 1, verse 4 and 5. If you back up, he says, grace to you from the one who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood. Okay, here's the deal. Over and over and over, John reminds this church family that Jesus Christ has suffered for them and endured for them and poured out his life for them, not just as an example for them, but as their Savior who has loved them first with an unparalleled kind of love when they deserve none of it. In, o in order that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they'd be motivated, they'd be empowered to follow in Jesus' steps. You see, what he's calling them to, it's not possible. It's not something that you can just do without the power of God, without the presence of God at work in you. And yet, this is crazy. In the words of the Apostle Paul, here's another letter to another church in Philippi, Philippians 2. Paul says, hey church, hey brother, hey sister, you work out your salvation. And he works in you both to will it and to do it. No, wait. You work out your own salvation. You make the choice. You make the decisions. You decide. You make the effort. You pour out your life for him. You begin to do that. You lean in. 
You choose to worship. You take responsibility. You choose to repent. You surrender. You choose to step out in faith. You say no to temptation and obey the words of Jesus Christ. You choose to work out that faith muscle and grow and be honest in gospel-centered community when you fail. You choose to hold on to Jesus Christ. And yet, this is the mystery of our faith. When you look back at your life and when you dig into the scriptures, what you realize is that it's been him all along. He's been at work in you the whole time. Again, in the words of Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, church, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. All our praise goes to him. Okay? On the entire, our entire journey of faith, it's all by his grace. It's all because of his grace. And yet, yet, you decide. The warning to the church at Ephesus is that if you don't repent, verse 5, he says, I will come to you and I'll remove your lampstand from its place. And he's essentially saying to this church family, hey, if you're not going to burn brightly for me, then, uh, listen, I'm slow to anger. I, I, I am full of steadfast love and, and faithfulness. And I have made a way for sin to be forgiven, but I'm not going to be patient forever. I will come and I will blow out what remains and you'll no longer be a local expression of my body. Now, Here's the thing. When God gives warnings like this, what we should understand is that for the individuals that make up that church, they are a means of his grace. What? what is it? They're a means of grace. In other words, they are an expression of his kindness because what they are, are an, is an invitation to repent and experience his promise of forgiveness and his faithfulness. Okay? His warnings will be heard differently by different people this morning. For those who have not truly been born again by the Holy Spirit, maybe, I don't know, you're still considering the gospel, or, or you haven't yet grabbed onto the grace that you've been invited to receive in Jesus Christ. Or maybe you've been sitting in here performing and pretending and for years, and you just don't have what you claim to have, right? The warning is intended to wake you up to the reality of your condition and to invite you to repent and believe the gospel and receive the gift of what it means to be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. Simple as that. Simple as that. And yet, for those who are genuine followers of Jesus Christ, God's warnings will be heard a little bit differently. Okay, Maybe you've been drifting. And maybe you've been wandering on a roundabout of stupidity, chasing after other things than Jesus to save you. Okay? God's warning should encourage you and exhort you that if you claim to have the Holy Spirit living in you, then the way that you live and the way that you love should be looking very different than those who don't. The warning is a means that God will use to wake you up, okay? to ignite and to fuel and to enable you to persevere in your faith and to keep trusting Jesus to the end. Okay? But there's not just a warning here. There's more than that. Remember, there's commendations. And then there's one more commendation here in verse 6. One more attaboy. Look at this. You do, you, yet you do have this, he says. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, most commentators agree that this can refer, or this refers to a group of licentious, uh, you know, like, don't tell me there are rules to following Jesus. I can follow him and live however I want kind of people, right? In Ephesus, it's probably uh, the, the people who tolerated the occult practices of the day, and they were compromising what Jesus taught about how to deal with the desires of their eyes and the lust of the flesh. And, you know, they had one foot in Christianity and one foot in the world, and they're trying to drag Christians out to just live however they want. And again, this church isn't tolerating that, and they're commended for, for that. But there's not just a warning, there's not just commendations. Notice at the end here, there's a promise. Notice that he lands on a promise, verse 7. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, back over in John's first letter, 1 John 5, Five, five, he actually explained that our faith in Jesus Christ is the victory that overcomes the world. Okay? To be able to be pure in the face of temptation. To be able to persevere in, in the face of op opposition and oppression. Guess what, though? Guess what? That doesn't mean that we won't ever experience battles with sin. Okay? 
at times we will all find ourselves on the roundabout of stupidity. Okay? And when we travel on a path of sin, well, we should expect that there will often be consequences that we have to face in our lives. Choose to sin, choose to suffer. Okay? But ultimately, if we've been born again, the promise of Jesus Christ is that He is faithful. Amen. He will hold on to us. The Holy Spirit will open our eyes through the Scripture, through worship, through our brothers and sisters who have the Spirit, the truth about who He is and what He's done and what He's promised about who we are will remember from where we have fallen. And He will empower us to repent. We'll run back to Jesus Christ, the one who has given us the victory, and it will again be lived out in our lives or evidence in our lives. This is God's promise to all genuine believers. And yet, we should be honest, we must not assume that every member of a local church in every period of history is a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, out of the mouth of Jesus, there will be those on that day who say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? We worked in children's church. He says, hey, I never knew you. I never knew you. Specifically, the promise here in verse 7 is the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If you recall, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, and God drove them from his presence in the paradise, the Garden of Eden, humanity was kept from this, the, the tree of life, which symbolizes the eternal kind of life that God created us to enjoy with him. And so what you have here is the promise that all overcomers will live forever eating from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Now, Eden was an amazing paradise, but listen to where this story is headed. Revelation 22, uh, starting verse 1 the last chapter in the Bible. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down uh, the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing, the well-being, the enjoyment of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The last book of the Bible, Revelation 21.1, then I saw new heavens and a new earth. The story of the Bible is the good news about how far God has gone to redeem this broken world from the curse and the consequences of our sin. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God left heaven and added human nature to his divine nature. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born to a Jewish woman, given the name Jesus, and he claimed to be the promised Messiah. He lived a perfect life, and he bore our sin on the cross in our place. By his death and resurrection, he conquered sin, death, hell, and the devil. And in so doing, he has made a way for sinful rebels like you and me to be reconciled to God, that we might enjoy an eternal kind of life with Him in a restored kingdom. That's the gospel. Okay? For the one who overcomes, when you get there, okay, when the new heavens and the new earth is going to be here, by the way, on a restored earth, there's going to be a tree of life. And I don't know exactly what that means, except that it's about the eternal enjoyment of God's presence. There, where God will live with us from his throne will come the river on both sides the symbols of eternal life which we will enjoy forever in the paradise of God. And here's the invitation. The invitation for each of the seven churches then and, and, and for those of us in here today is that we would be men and women who conquer, who overcome the lies of the devil, the pull of our sinful nature and the broken philosophies of this world. How? By grabbing hold of and holding on to faith in Jesus Christ the only one who has overcome.